Welcome to Building Wealth and Mental Health Podcast. My name is Randall Avery. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Nadine Caslow. Nadine chronicles her career journey servicing marginalized communities in the mental health field. What is interesting about her journey interacting with marginalized populations is that it did not start after college. It really began when she was introduced to an urban dance studio in Philadelphia called the Phila Danco. Nadine shares that her mom was a practicing psychologist in the 60s at a time where women achieving their doctorate was a challenge. She described what type of impact this had on her life. Nadine discloses her income at her first job out of college and how she was able to make ends meet early on in her career. We delve into a fun conversation concerning what it was like to take a job in the South in the 1990s and the different cultural expectations she experienced working in the South compared to living in the North. Nadine provides insights into how she was able to navigate those cultural differences early on in her career. Don't miss the practical financial approach Nadine has taken with her money, allowing her to have career and lifestyle flexibility that she is able to enjoy. I hope you enjoy my episode with Dr. Nadine Caslow. How are you doing, everybody? My name is Randall Avery, owner of RSA Diesel Advisors, a wealth management firm serving clients in the Atlanta metro area and across the United States. Today, we have a special guest, Dr. Ka- Dr. Caslow. Um, she is coming with the vast amount of experience. I've known her for a couple of years, and she is always giving me insights. So hopefully, she will be able to provide you some insights into different career paths in the mental health space. So with that said, um, Nadine, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Dr. Nadine Caslow, and I'm a professor at Emory University School of Medicine, (laughs) excuse me, in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. I'm also the vice chair for the department, vice chair for faculty development, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm the chief psychologist at Grady Hospital or Grady Health System. And among many other responsibilities I have, I'm the past president of the American Psychological Association, which is the largest organization in the world for psychologists. Wow. Starting off your career, did you ever think you'd be involved in so many different organizations and touch so many different people? No, I had no idea. Um, I had absolutely no idea. I didn't have that much confidence. Um, I, I, you know, was just trying to put one foot in front of the other and go to college and go to graduate school and get my first job and contribute and to be a servant leader and to give back to the community. That is awesome. When you think about, you know, who you work with, your population, do you consider yourself having a specialty? And if you do have a specialty, what is that population? So I would say I have a couple of specialties. So as I mentioned, I work at both Grady and Emory. Grady is a large inner city hospital that pro- primarily cares for low income people of color. At Grady, I work with two particular groups of people the most. One is people with serious and persistent mental health problems or mental illness, serious mental illness. Um, And the other group of people is I run a big project, the NIA project, which is for um, people who have had a lot of interpersonal violence in their lives, maybe childhood abuse, maybe intimate partner violence or domestic violence, and where they felt so kind of helpless and hopeless and badly about themselves that they felt like no way, there was no way out but for them to attempt suicide. And so that's sort of the sort of two main groups I work with at, at um, Grady. And then through my sort of practice at Emory, I see a lot of physicians, both individually and um, in couples, you know, couples therapy, lots of faculty, but I'm also the psychologist for the Atlanta Ballet. And so I see a lot of ballet dancers in therapy also. Wow. Where would you say you sit in both Emory and at the Grady Hospital as far as, where do you sit in the org chart? Do you have any people who report directly to you? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I, I'm, 
as chief psychologist, I have psychology faculty who report to me. I run a very large postdoctoral residency program and have um, over 20 postdocs who report to me um, as vice chair in our department. I have lots and lots of responsibilities that way as well. So um, I've also held pretty major leadership roles at Emory in terms of, for example, being president of the University Senate. So um, I've had a lot of leadership opportunities. That's awesome. So let's take it back. So think of you think of your time before you went into high school. Can you kind of explain your childhood? How was your upbringing? Something that the audience may be able to relate to. Sure. So I was really fortunate to grow up in a family where my parents were happily married and they were happily married for over 60 years until my dad died a couple of years ago. Um, when I was born and young, we didn't have very much money. Um, we kind of were able to make ends meet, and maybe a little better than that, but, but certainly did not have a lot of money. My parents, however, really valued um, education. And so we moved to a neighborhood where there were as good public schools as there possibly could be in the area for elementary school. And so I would say at that point, in many ways, we were kind of the the poorest kids on the block. Um, but our parents really valued moving there, giving us a better education, and they really valued traveling. And so they sort of said, well, we don't have enough money to do things like send you to camp and take a summer vacation. Which would you prefer? And we always pick the summer vacation or to join the cl country club or, or go on a summer vacation. We always pick the summer vacation. So we, we had the chance to travel. When I was in elementary school, my mom went back to school and she got her doctorate. So she is also a psychologist. She got her doctorate in psychology when I was in elementary school. That was in the late 60s and nobody else's mom was mm -hmm. called doctor anything. I didn't have any other friends whose moms were doctors, whose moms went to school. Um, and so I really had um, her as a role model, but my parents as role models for being a couple where both parents were actively involved with the kids, where they shared responsibilities, um, whether that was for our activities or schoolwork or whatever it was for. And so I was really very fortunate that, that way. Um, and so, uh, we had, um, I was very involved in ballet. I started ballet lessons when I was three, ended up dancing ballet professionally. Um, and I also did a lot of other things at school, a lot of um, theater stuff and, and things like that. Um, piano lessons, I was in the orchestra. Um, so I was um, pretty involved in activities as well as academics. Very good. Now, going into high school, were you aware of the profession of psychology or the mental health space at all? Well, sure, because my mom was a psychologist. So I, I was aware, she had friends that were psychologists. Um, and so I, absolutely, I had way more awareness of that space than, than most kids, certainly my age or that I knew. You know, now there's things like AP psychology courses and things like that, but they didn't have that back when I was growing up. So really the exposure I had was, was my mom and her, and her colleagues. And what did you think that exposure did for you to say, I want to follow those steps. I want to spend so many years of school because it sounded like you were pretty active and had a lot of interests, but hunkering down and going through those studies, what do you think your mom experience triggered you to follow suit? Yeah, so I mean, I've thought a lot about that. We joke a lot about that in our family because my dad was a financial planner. My brother's a financial planner. My mom's a psychologist. I'm a psychologist. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about that in our family. You know, is that genetics? Is that environment? Mm -hmm. um, is it a combination? Is it who we are as, as people? And um, that's just what we were drawn to. I didn't, you know, go to high school thinking I was going to be a psychologist. I kind of wondered about just being a ballet dancer, honestly. Mm -hmm. I, I considered other careers, but I, I did declare myself a psychology major. 
as soon as I went to college. Um, so clearly there was a part of me that knew I was headed in that direction. I don't know that I was 100% clear about that. Um, it, it was, certainly there was exposure to my mom, but when I, when I really thought about it, I was the kid that other kids would come to with their problems. And I would try to help them with their problems, you know, just sort of a junior psychologist, so to speak. I loved reading, but I often was drawn to books that had to do with, you know, kids with mental health issues or um, developmental disabilities or adults with mental health troubles. So that sort of the things I found myself reading and the, the just way I was with my friends, I think was part of my early training as a psychologist. How did you decide which college to go to? Your, your parents, you know, they, they have their degrees. And so you had that exposure there. Did you receive any guidance, say this college is good for psychology or was it this college is good for any other activity which made you make your decision? Yeah, I, I did not choose a college based on psychology. Um, I honestly did not apply to many colleges. Um, I think back then people maybe didn't apply quite as much. Um, I really, really, really wanted to go to Yale and I didn't get in and I was really devastated by that. And so it was almost like I didn't care so much where I went because I felt badly that I hadn't gotten in where I wanted to go. Interestingly, my first job was on the faculty at Yale. So I sort of ended up there later, but, but, but not for college. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania and um, I was fortunate that they had a really wonderful psychology department and that I had um, the opportunity to get involved in a lot of very exciting research. I don't think I ever even thought about doing research. Maybe I heard you needed to do research to get into graduate school. I, I know I heard that. But I didn't see myself as somebody who was going to do research, but I was exposed to some very famous psychologists and some people who went on to become very well known uh, and very accomplished who were fabulous researchers and gave me great, great opportunities when I was in college. So I ended up um, graduating in three years with two publications. And that was critically important, especially since I'm somebody who doesn't test very well. I didn't do great on the SATs, which is probably why I didn't get into Yale. And I didn't do great on the GREs. And so things like publications and research experience ended up being so very important for my career. How would you describe your undergraduate experience in school? Were you very big into studies? Did you also have other you know, physical activities that you're involved in like ballet? Who were you in college? So I was a goody-goody in college. Um, I was definitely a goody-goody. Um, I was very studious. As I said, I graduated from an Ivy League school in three years. So I was sort of very focused. But I was also still dancing ballet very actively, um, performing. And I actually started the ballet program at Penn. And they sort of... I. I, instead of going to the freshman dorms, I ended up applying to be in what they had was an arts house. Um, and I applied for that, got in, and they ended up building me a ballet studio. And I taught a lot of ballet classes when I was in college, a lot of ballet classes. Um, and I also um, got a senatorial scholarship uh, to go to college. My parents sort of were in that group that uh, made too much money for me to be able to get a scholarship and not enough money to afford for me to go. And so I was, I applied for and received a senatorial scholarship in the arts. And it, the requirement of the scholarship was that I had to bring arts to the community. Mm. And that was like perfect for me. And in sort of in keeping with my, who I am really today in terms of wanting to give to the community. Um, and so I started a children's dance group and we performed at inner city schools in Philadelphia, 
Uh, we performed at senior citizen facilities. Um, we performed in the subway and we performed at the children's hospital. And, um, and so that was a big part of what I did at college was teach ballet, run this children's dance group in addition to studying. And of course, definitely socializing. I mean, I had friends and, um, and that was a really important part of my life also. How did you balance your time? That, that's a lot, um, running a, a dance program, going into the inner city, you know, it's not just dealing with the kids. There's some touch points with parents and then you have your school and then you mentioned your social life. Did you have, were you taught at a young age? This is how you manage your time. Is that something you had to evolve as school went on for you? I, I think that um, when I kind of talk to other people now and even back then, I think that's probably something that comes more easily to me than to other people is to manage my time. Probably I saw my parents role model that. I don't know that they how much they taught us that, but they role modeled um, good time management. And um, I have my calendars, you know, they were hard ca copy calendars. Now it's not like I had the now I have my calendar on my phone, uh, or my computer, whatever, but it was a hard copy calendar. And I have these little books, these calendar books, and I, and I haven't thrown them out. And I'm not somebody who saves things like that much, but they sort of, you know, at nine o'clock I had this and 10 o'clock this and 11 o'clock. And you can see it's this very structured thing. Even my socializing was structured into my calendar, which truthfully is still how it is today. So I think that I, recognized that the calendar or the schedule, whatever was gonna, was gonna be sort of my, one of my best friends, or now I, sometimes I call it my brain. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that I was gonna, the only way to do all those things was to be pretty clear about what I did when. So with your experience working in the inner city, are there some, some knowledge or experiences from that that you're applying currently in your work? Or did most of the work, way you approach your work come academically? No, th there's actually no question that my experiences from a much younger age influence the work I do today. My first actually um, experience was that there is a, a African-American dance company in Philadelphia called Philodanko. It's a very well-known um, dance company actually. And when I was 12 or 13, they were putting on a performance one summer and they needed a young white um, female to be in the performance with them. And so I went, did the audition and got into that, well, I got the role. And so I danced with Phil Danko one summer and it was really a great opportunity for me to um, be the only white kid to, um, you know, people talk a lot about, you know, being a, the only person of color in a setting, but I think white people don't get that experience very often and certainly don't get it very often when they're kids. And I feel like that was actually in retrospect, um, a, a defining period in my life of really working closely with people who, were different than me, looked different than me, but had such shared values and goals and passions. And we formed really important and valuable vital bonds. Um, and, and so I think that, that that experience probably set the stage for me to be invested in doing work that was culturally responsive, to work with communities that were different from me. Um, and to connect with people in meaningful ways. So I actually think I learned a lot from that. There's no question doing the children's dance groups in the, in the inner city um, and just realizing the joy that we could bring into children's lives um, and how much, how valuable that was and whether it was at the schools or it was at the children's hospital, I think those were the two places I enjoyed going the most, um, I, I saw that just having people who hang out with you and play with you and are kind and compassionate and generous, what a difference that could make in a child's 
child's life. And, um, but I remember um, sort of kids in the school not having enough food to eat. And um, I didn't, nobody really talked to me about that, but I remember going out and bring in some food every time we would go and do our children's dance group. And I think that it, it just sort of was part of who I was. I think those experiences mattered way more than any academic training I ever got. And it was sort of doing little things like bringing food and seeing what a difference that made to people. And so, for example, in the program I run now, the NIA project, um, during the pandemic, we were able to get money um, to be sure that everybody in our project had the food that they needed to eat during the pandemic when they didn't have the resources maybe to get that food. And so I think that that experience when I was in college, just getting how important things like food were to people who didn't have it um, or to people who were in food deserts and so maybe didn't have healthy food. Um, I think I've taken that pill today. And so the pandemic hit and I really prioritized making sure that the people that I work with at Grady, that we were able to, I, I actually used Amazon and had food sent to, to their homes so that they had enough food to eat. Where, where did you think that heart, that, that big heart of yours came from? Um, is it, was it kind of, you know, growing up, it was like, look out for others. Or was it a natural curiosity about humanity that drove you to be so compassionate? Or do you know? You know, I, I've, I've wondered that as I've been honored with these major service awards, you know, Emory University's highest award for service, Emory School of Medicine's highest award for service. You know, people always ask me that question and my, my parents were and are certainly generous, but not in this same kind of way. Um, I don't really know. I sort of feel like it's something I had from the time I was little, that it was inside of me. I think now it, it goes with values and, um, you know, I have a, it's much more articulated my views about this and the importance of giving back to our communities, of paying it forward. You know, I have sort of values about it, but, but this is just something always that has brought me meaning, um, but I also feel like I, I want to help other people and partner with them, and, and it brings me pleasure to, to help other people. Wow. So you're, let's, we, we're taking it back. You're in college now. Your mom was a psychologist. Did you have any understanding of what a psychologist made in the different levels, whether you have your master's or if you have your doctorate, did you even think about what type of income I would make in this profession? I did not. And that's, you know, it's not just that my mom was a psychologist. I, as I said, my dad was a financial planner. So he would not be thrilled to hear that the answer was no. And he was really good about teaching us about money. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't even think I asked. I, I, I knew I'd make less than a physician. I did know that. Um, but, but I don't even think I knew what those numbers meant or what you could live with if you had X amount of money or Y amount of money. Um, you know, as I said, I, I certainly saw my parents up class as I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw the differences in how money could help, but they both grew up really, really poor. Mm -hmm. And so I think they, as many people who grow up poor, um, that didn't really have, they sort of had a different attitude about money. Um, uh, much more, a very careful, uh, cautious, thoughtful, well, careful and cautious attitude about money and sort of always worried that maybe there would be enough money. Um, and so, no, I did not have any idea what kind of, what a starting salary would look like, or quite frankly, how much money I could make today. When would you say you fell in love with your profession? Was it a class, a teacher, an experience? When did it trigger to say, okay, 
my heart is growing every time I'm practicing or doing something that makes a difference. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I don't know that there was sort of a moment. Um, I think it was more like a, a process mm -hmm. over time. I don't feel like for me, there was sort of one moment. There were certainly people along the way that made a difference, but I, some people will say they had a class, they had a professor, they had a, some experience. It was like an aha experience for them. I did not really have that. I think it's um, been more of a process of falling in love with, the, with being a psychologist and, and taking care of not just other individuals and families, but also being able to help communities more broadly. So you're in undergraduate school. Now you have to make a decision which grad school I decide to go to. What was your thinking process in that? My thinking process in that was I really want to go get my PhD in clinical psychology. I was really clear about that. I have very good grades. I have these publications. <coughs> I have great letters of recommendation, but I don't have good GRE scores. Mm -hmm. And I was extremely worried about how this was going to go and applied quite broadly, um, very much concerned that I wouldn't be able to get in because I didn't have really strong GRE scores. Mm -hmm. And there are definitely places that I did not get in because of that. There's no question about it. I was very fortunate that my undergraduate advisor um, wrote me really a, a stellar letter of recommendation um, and also reached out to some other well-known, he was a depression researcher and reached out to other well-known depression researchers and basically said, you know, I know her GREs aren't great, but I really recommend that you consider her seriously. And I think it was that outreach on my behalf that probably made the difference. And I believe that so strongly that I very often reach out on my students' behalf in that extra kind of way to help them because I recognize that maybe this person doesn't have the greatest grades and that person doesn't have the greatest scores and this one didn't get any publication opportunities, but that they're gonna be a really good psychologist. And that it's not fair that people who don't test well, don't go to institutions that maybe have as many opportunities to get some of those things can get them, um, doesn't mean they're not gonna be really good psychologists. And so I, often will reach out extra on people's behalf. So honestly, I went to where I got into, where I thought I would get the best training with the person that I thought um, would offer me the most opportunities. It wasn't like I had a dream school or something like that. I just wanted to get in somewhere. So you're in? You decided your, your PhD program. What was that like for you? How would you describe your experience, either studying, the other activities they had you perform? What was your experience in the PhD program? So my first year of graduate school, I went to the University of Pittsburgh um, the day of the Super Bowl. And I remember this because the Steelers were in the Super Bowl. So I, I know what day it was. We were at my advisor's house and he mentioned that he had gone to Houston and basically he wasn't explicit about it, but we kind of got the message. It was like, he got a new job or he was gonna get a new job. And so, <laughs> excuse me, he ended up moving to Houston and inviting me to come with him. Mm -hmm. I had a very serious relationship at that time with a man I had started seeing in high school, through college, now the beginning of graduate school. And so, there were the issues of balancing relationship with my career. My family was in Philadelphia. Now I'd be moving to Texas, way further away. Lots of really um, challenging decisions, trying to figure out uh, whether I would stay in Pittsburgh and work with somebody who was there or 
transfer graduate schools, I really struggled with that decision. Um, got input and advice from multiple people and, and ultimately made a decision that certainly professionally was a really good, wise decision for me. And that was to transfer to the University of Houston to continue to work with my graduate school advisor and to go to a program that was really growing. It was at a time where Texas was sort of in the oil boom and Texas had a lot of money and they were able to bring in a lot of uh, new faculty and had a lot of resources. So that was sort of one thing I struggled with in, in graduate school. I realized I really liked doing research, but that I loved doing clinical work. I loved doing psychotherapy, uh, seeing patients, but it was again clear that I didn't just want to do sort of outpatient psychotherapy with people like you and me, um, that I liked working at the hospital with people in acute distress, with medical problems. Um, and um, I don't think I decided then, well, I'm going to have a balance of this in my career. But I certainly realized that I was drawn to um, pursuing and seeking out different opportunities than most of my classmates. And for me, I think it's a really good message that if you don't get what you want in, in graduate school, there are ways to figure out how to get what you want um, to create opportunities to do that. And so I really kept up the balance, <coughs> excuse me, of um, you know, doing research and doing well academically and, and also um, having a whole range of clinical experiences with very diverse populations, diverse in terms of age, diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, social class, socio-demographic, sexual orientation, um, you know, the sort of whole range of socio-demographics, inpatient and outpatient settings, much more variety than most people, than most people ever get. Um, and, and people were saying, you know, you have to decide if you're a child person, because my research was all with kids, or if you're an adult person, or you're this, or you're that. And ultimately, the truth was I decided I can't decide, and I still can't decide. And this is many, many years later, I'm a generalist, and I like doing a lot of different things with different people, and I like the diversity of activities in my life. And so I went to Madison, Wisconsin for my internship and postdoctoral residency, and there really got to continue to, to pursue being a generalist and getting a, a wonderful wealth of opportunities and, and great supervision um, and teaching. And I really came in graduate school and on internship and postdoc to appreciate the value of wonderful mentors and teachers. You mentioned something that is probably not talked about a lot. You, you, you mentioned you had to make a personal decision when you decided to get your doctorate program. The, the, the balance between personal life, academic achievement, career achievement, it's something that I hear a lot with, with my clients and those I talk to. How do you see that now being able to look back? Because there is a sacrifice, um, especially if you want to deal with academia, meaning you have to move around. If you want to continue your education, sometimes you can't go into the school that's right next door. What is, what is your advice? What is your experience through that? What is something you want to share about that point? Sure. You know, the truth is we have many things we value in our lives. We have relationships we value. We have our careers that we value. And, and we can have lots of different things we value and do, and that works fine until those values come in competition. And it's when those values that come in competition that we have to then choose if we can't have both. If we can figure out how to do both, great. But if we can't, then we have to choose at that moment in life for who we are as individuals, which value comes higher for us. And we may make different choices at different times in our lives. But I think, I think it's really important to be clear what our values are, what are the things that really, really matter to us. 
and and be intentional about that. So the day my mom got her doctorate was the only time I was ever called to the principal's office mm-hmm. to when she called the school to say she had successfully defended her dissertation. And I was able to talk to her to say congratulations. And again, I was in elementary school. And after I said congratulations, I said, do I call you mommy doctor or Dr. Mommy? And she said, mommy doctor, I'm always your mommy first. And that was a clear value. And as a child of a professional parent, that was a really important thing to hear. That's why I remember it. I don't remember most conversations I had with my mother when I was in elementary school, but I remember that. And I think we need to, there's always personal and professional in every decision, whether or not you have a partner or your family or your children, it's how much time you can have outside of work. It's, there's a million, you know, how much time can you exercise or take a walk or do the things that you love? There's always a personal and professional balance that always has to be navigated. And we have to figure out, you know, what, what matters most um, to us at, at, at what time and how are we going to make choices based on our values. Good. So you, 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 you've done, you've done your postdoc work. What was your first job after postdoc? And if you don't mind sharing, what was your starting salary at that point? (laughs) Sure. My first job was to be an assistant professor at Yale University School of Medicine. Um, And as I said to people, it was nice to look at the top of the paycheck, but not so much at the rest of the paycheck. So um, my salary was somewhere, it was either 36 or Um, $38,000. And and so you're, um, like you said, your your, your dad and your brother are financial services. So you had some idea what to do with your money. Did you do those things that you were taught initially? or did you kind of do your own thing when you first started making a salary? I would say a combination of the two. I mean, I had to pay off some loans, so I had to prioritize that. 36 to 38, whatever it is, it's not a lot of money. So there wasn't a lot of, it's not like there was discretionary funds there. So I pretty much paid for the basics, paid for, (laughs) excuse me, whatever I had to pay for this loan. Um, and I think the thing that I didn't do that my dad talked to me about doing was like, I put whatever the minimum was you could put away for retirement. I I did that, whatever the absolute minimum was that, you know, sort of just, and I didn't put in a penny more than that. Um, and the whole issue of the, you know institutional matching, and if you put in more, the institution matches you, and then that helps it grow. Like I was just like, well, what's the least amount I can do because you know I have to figure out food and I have to figure out gas, and and so that's so I, I certainly was responsible about money. I always paid my bills on time. I, I mean, I, in those ways, I did what I was taught, but sort of thinking down the way. Um, And it's funny because I have, you know, my retirement account from Yale. When I came to Emory, I kept it at Yale. That's what you had to do. And then this rollout thing happened. And so I actually know how much or little was ever in that account. Um, You know, it was the minimal amount there could be. So, so a lot of people will say, especially in this day and age, how can you have fun? How can you enjoy life just taking care of the basics or just being able to afford the basics? What were your hobbies? What did you do to spend your time to make you smile if you couldn't go on those lavish vacations that we see? Yeah, so I've always been really good about spending time with my friends. Um, really, really good about spending time with my friends. Very um, very much do that. And, you know, we went out to eat 
but where we went out to eat has changed over the years. Of course, now during COVID, I'm not really going out to eat, but prior to COVID, you know, I, um, I would find the least expensive kind of places to go. I'm a vegetarian, but you now we, we made different kinds of choices. So I wouldn't stop seeing my friends or not see people. It was just what, what we might eat would be less. I went to, I've always had tickets to the theater, um, tickets to baseball. I love baseball, the baseball games, to dance performances, but I would get student tickets. I would get, um, you know, go to New York and stand in line for the two for one tickets. I mean, I would decide what I wanted to do and I figured out how much discretionary money I could have for the month and for the year. So I was very thoughtful about that. You know, I knew I needed some play money and I put aside a certain amount of play money a month and a year. And the reason I say a month and a year is because if I wanted to use more in March, let's say I had a friend in New Haven, we used to, we like to go to New York one day a year. Um, and well, that costs more than say, maybe what I did in February. Well, I let myself do that if in February I did less, in April I did less. It would. So I, I, well, I had a discretionary amount. I allowed for some freedom over the course of the year. Um, and um, I love getting massages, um, manicures and pedicures, you know, things like that, those sort of self-care things. But now I might go to a really nice spa to do those things. Uh, before I didn't go to a really nice spa, but I could still have those things. So I've made sort of, I, I've done the things I like, but sort of the level that I do them, the frequency that I do them, um, that's changed as I've, as my financial situation has changed. Um, I knew I didn't buy a house initially, but when I bought my first house, I remember my brother, who at that point was a financial planner also, he and my dad talking to me about not being house poor, um, sort of really figuring out not just what it said now would be the equivalent of online, you're gonna, your house payments are going to be, but what your real house payment is going to be each month and what can you afford. And if you want to do other things in life, how to not be house poor. And so I didn't have maybe as nice of a house. Well, I know I didn't have as nice as a house as I would have liked for a really long time. Um, but I wasn't so strapped financially that I couldn't travel or buy people gifts or things like that. So we have to decide what's most important for us. Good advice. Now, one thing I also notice in this profession, you go to school for so long. Well, those who are your friends, people who you graduated high school with, they may have went to college, graduated, been in their field maybe two or three years, which could have a gap in earning potential, lifestyle choices, and preferences. How did you perceive your friends handling money? And did that conflict because you were relatively responsible to your peers? And maybe there could have been an income difference back then. Yeah, so for me, the income difference was less about them getting out and working and more about them going into careers like medicine where they made a lot more money than me. Mm. Um, or even going into private practice as a psychologist and making more money than me. So for me, it was, it was more sort of, we all went to school for a really long time, but then when we came out, our earning potential was really different. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my friends are pretty, we're pretty good at being honest and open with each other about things. I, I remember the biggest thing that it came up around is when we would say divide up the bill after we ate, you know, especially those group meals and I don't drink. And of course, one of the biggest things that costs money on those group bills is the alcohol. And, um, and I remember making what felt like a really hard decision back then. Um, and I was worried people were going to quit inviting me to group things mm -hmm. that I would go and split the meal part, even though I was a vegetarian and didn't eat all the food people ate, but that I would not split the alcohol part. 
Um, and I remember that really being worried about the consequences of that decision. <laughs> but that just didn't fit in my budget. Mm -hmm. um, those group meals with all the alcohol. And I don't ever think that I wasn't invited to something because of that. I worried about that. But I'm actually not sure it ever came to fruition, that worry. So what, what my friends and I have been pretty good about doing is if we wanted to do something and one person could afford more than the other person, we either made the decision to only do what the person who had less money could do, or maybe the person with more money said, don't worry about the difference. You figure out what you can do and I'll take care of the rest. Um, and, and I think that's been really important because I think so many people end up feeling obligated to have to get the house at the beach and pay more than they feel like they can pay. And then they're really struggling. My friend networks have been really good about people being honest about what they could or couldn't do without ever having to explain why that was. Um, some people were taking care of kids and some people parents and some people had more student loans and it didn't matter why it was. People just um, being clear about what they could and couldn't do. Big. That's real big. Um, and I guess that kind of showed you they, they were your friends. They just wanted you to be around even if they couldn't divide it evenly by four. Did that mean you brought a calculator or were you just that good with math when the ticket came in? Because that's that's a complicated formula if you have enough people, especially. Yeah, yeah. well, I, 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 I am pretty good at math, okay. or at least that kind yeah. of math. You know, I did get that part of the finance brain. Um, I don't, oh, I didn't bring a calculator. <laughs> I mean, that, I was not that nerdy. I was a goody goody, but I wasn't that nerdy. Um, I don't think those kids get invited to group dinners. Um, sure. You know, now we all have calculators on our phones. It's yeah. pretty easy, but now I don't, I don't struggle with it in the same way. So first job, Yale, um, what was that experience like? And what was the key thing you took for that job? And how did it feel working at the school you always wanted to attend growing up? Well, you know, on the one hand, I felt like it was a big success that I landed that job. And on the other hand, when I wasn't all that happy there, I think it made it harder for me to leave because I felt like, well, this had been my dream. I finally get this dream and I'm not happy here, but I need to stay because it was sort of like my dream. Um, there were many good thing, it, you know, as any job, there were many good things, but it wasn't the best fit for me overall. And, um, and on the balance, I think I was clear that maybe I could find somewhere that was a better fit where I'd be happier. And that was indeed true. And so I went on the job market one year, didn't find anything that I was convinced would definitely be a better fit. And then the second year, um, went on the job market a second time and found this job at Emory and Grady and have been here since 1990. And I love it here. It has definitely been a better fit for me. What would say landed you the job? Were you just great at interviewing? Or did you look really well on paper? What landed you the job in Emory? So there's no question I looked good on paper. I came from Yale, I um, had a lot of publications. Um, there's, there's no question, but I think that's what get, gets you the interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my experience now being on the other side and interviewing lots of people is paper can help you get the interview, but rarely does it or should it be why you get the job. I really think, um, you know, it's about interviewing well, but it's also about those moments when you're, say, on the interview that are in between the actual formal interviews, the connecting with people, the having a sense that your values are similar to the values of the people that you'll be working with, that you're going to fit in interpersonally, not just that you bring knowledge and skills that sort of add to the team. Um, and so um, I... 
had some you know funny challenging stories to navigate in my job interview here and i suspect part of it was how i navigated those awkward situations um i don't i don't mean to imply that they purposely made that happen but there were things that were awkward in the interview and i think how i handled that made a big difference um i think people were looking for a leader i think people wanted um, somebody who they felt like could work well both at Grady and Emory, which are two very different environments. And so a lot had to do with those more sort of intangible things, um, the more interpersonal things, professionalism, uh, value on diversity and cultural humility. Um, and Quite frankly, I think people wondered whether a northerner would fit in down here in the south. Um, probably the, the biggest plus that I had to that was that the um, Braves had their spring training camp in um, Palm Beach at the time. Mm -hmm. My family had moved to Palm Beach. My brother was there and he had um, spring training tickets to the Braves. Mm -hmm. And so he was all about my moving to Atlanta where there were the Atlanta Braves. So, so you never know what's going to really make a difference for you. Yeah. It, it, a lot of times you look back and just laugh at those experiences. So you're moving to Atlanta. What would you say is the biggest cultural difference? Is it the amount of fried food you have to eat now? Was it, um, I'm not sure, the, you know, the, the Southern twang. What was the big thing that stood out to you at that time? Well, since I don't eat that fried food, it <laughs> definitely wasn't that. So the, the first thing was actually at the airport when I got picked up. Mm -hmm. um, male colleague picked me up and my suitcase was coming off the conveyor, you know, the belt thing. And I went to pick it up because up in the north, you know, you're an independent woman and you take your own suitcase. And there was this moment and I, he and I laughed about this but I don't know what happened but I there was a look in his eyes like of course he was taking the suitcase <laughs> and I'm like the guy's gonna take my suitcase like nah this can't happen and he of course picked up the suitcase and then what did he do but he went to open the car door for me and I had again had the sense that if, if in New Haven, I hadn't opened my own car door, I wouldn't have gotten a job. Here, if I had opened the car door, I wouldn't have gotten a job. And so it was like those kind of little, sort of more, some of those little things um, that, that are very um, subtle, but, um, you know, people up north talk faster. We mm -hmm. talk over each other that is considered to be very impolite here. Um, and I understand why. Um, and and a, a lot of people when they move to a different part of the country have a hard time making those shifts, um, changing how they speak in certain ways. So I don't think anybody would ever say I sound Southern I don't think I ever got a Southern twang, um, but I certainly have adjusted the tempo and timing of my speaking, my waiting till people finish sentences, you know, sort of fitting into the culture and the community in which we're embedded. I really liked how nice and friendly people were here. I liked that very much from the beginning. Um, I heard a lot of people from the North say, but it's just superficial and maybe it's superficial, maybe it's not, but in that friendliness, that superficial or not superficial friendliness allows you to be able to meet a lot of people and make a lot of connections. And um, I feel like I had, have had countless opportunities to do that in this community. So you moved down to work at Emory. What was the work as far as what population were you serving? What was your day-to-day -day task? Were you more on the academic side? Explain your job when you first arrived at Emory. So when I first arrived at Emory, I was 
the chief psychologist at Grady. So I had the other psychology faculty at Grady. We had a postdoc program then that had one to two postdocs. So I was in charge of the postdoc program, but, but it was a very small program to be in charge of. I was um, paid quite a bit of my salary was to work on the inpatient unit, the psychiatric inpatient unit at Grady. Um, so I did a lot of um, work on the psychiatric inpatient unit. Um, and there were expectations for me to do research and get grants and teach, um, supervise. And so that was what my job was. Well, you're there, so of course you enjoyed the work. Um, but what was it about that work that you enjoyed? <laughs> so, so I love the mission of Grady. I love, I have a real socio-political commitment to uh, working with people from marginalized communities who unfortunately have and continue to experience a lot of disparities, inequities, um, and to do my small part to try to redress that situation, to try to, um, you know, at this point, be an ally in uh, addressing structural racism. Um, I don't think I had those words back in 1990, but I think that was kind of what I was doing. Um, and, um, and so um, I, I think I really cared about trying to provide people with mental, serious mental illnesses who didn't have much money and many resources with more resources, but also with the quality of care mm. that they deserved. Mm -hmm. I really felt and saw that, you know, if you had more money, you got better care. And if you've got better care, you had better chance to, for recovery, better chance for resilience, better chance to have a good life. And so it was like a vicious cycle. And I wanted and continue to want to do my part to try to level the playing field so that everybody who struggles with mental health challenges has the services that they need and the opportunities that they need to, to lead as fulfilling and productive and positive lives as they can. So Atlanta is a special area, especially when you talk about diversity. <laughs> Um, I didn't know how special it was until I worked in different areas as an internal auditor. And you talk to, go to different cities and you realize, wow, Atlanta is different. From the work that you do working with, you know, those who are not traditionally supported in the mental health world, what makes Atlanta so special and a hub to work, work in, especially somebody who wants to follow your career path and work with these diverse communities? So, you know... I don't think we can underestimate the impact of Dr. Martin Luther King, of Representative John Lewis, of former Mayor Shirley Franklin, of Stacey Abrams. When, when I think about amazing humanitarians and civil rights leaders that, that are from our community, it just blows my mind. And, and so I think that there's a, a, a tradition and a culture here of, of nonviolent change, of speaking up and speaking out for what's right, um, for, um, for all humankind. And I, I think that that is in the fabric of in this of this community, I'm not saying we don't have a lot of problems. I'm not saying we don't have our challenges. We absolutely do, but I think that um, you know whether we look at the African American or uh, African descended community in Atlanta, or we look at sort of Buford Highway area, um, or we look at our willingness and openness to welcoming immigrants and refugees to our community. Um, there's just been an openness in lots of ways to diversity. And I do feel like having the Olympics here in the time of this city, you know, in the time of the history of this city, 
I feel like we became much more diverse and much more international with the Olympics. I, I feel like that changed us in some really positive ways. Um, and, you know, even the restaurants changed and the kind of food that's available here. Um, and that makes people feel more welcome here from different backgrounds and different cultures. Um, and I noticed a real change in that around the Olympics. So I think there's a long history. I think there are some more recent things. Um, and we have so much potential here for, for being a welcoming community from, to people from really different backgrounds. To, to work in the position that you're in, to stay in the position you're in, and to be able to have different opportunities, you have to be able to network. You mentioned that in the South, we, we wait to people complete their sentences. But how do you maintain, you know, you know, your position within the Atlanta community, because being a leader also means you always have to grab on different resources and, and call on different people and people have to sometimes like you. Um, what circles did you go to? What activities did you do early on in your career when you moved to Atlanta to really submit yourself as, hey, I'm, I'm somebody in this mental health space? So I don't know if somebody suggested this to me, my guess is somebody did. Um, maybe I came with, up with it myself. I don't really remember. But my first year here, I decided I would get together with a different person every week. And I would do that. I told myself I had to do that 50 times during the year. And I would have lunch or coffee or dinner with somebody different. And then I would ask them who else they thought I should meet with. And I'm not the most gregarious outgoing person in the world. Um, I'm, you know, I'm probably slight, a slight extrovert. Um, so I had to force myself to do that. For some people that would come more easily than it did for me. For other people it would be harder than it was for me. But I actually feel like that really helped me because some of those connections got me to other connections and some of those people that I met that year are, are actually still my friends. Um, but I think that it allowed me to begin to connect with a lot of different communities here, a lot of different people. Um, I learned a lot about the community and, um, and, I, and I really think that that helped. So that is a big part of what I did at the beginning. The other thing is that I volunteered a lot and I almost always said yes when I was asked to do things. Mm -hmm. So if, if somebody needed to, somebody to talk about topic X, sure, I'll talk about topic X or topic Y or come help give food to the homeless or you know whatever, whatever sort of the request was, if I could help out, I did. And I met a lot of people that way. And I didn't need to be front and center. I didn't need to be the one in charge. I didn't need to get paid, but I was just kind of there. And, and, and through that was able to get, to get more embedded in this community. I, I think you get, particularly if you come from, from outside a community, you get into a community by doing things in the community, being part of the community, connecting, connecting with people. And, and, you know, being, like you said, kind and friendly and compassionate and caring. Um, so I, I, that's, I think what I did, and that was relatively early in my career. So you're coming from up north, moving down to the south. So there's a cost of living adjustment. It also sounded like you received a little bit of a promotion. So there was incremental margins in your month to month spending. How did you approach that raise? Did you, you know, go crazy? Did you, um, what, what, how did you approach that increase in lifestyle, increase in positions? Because it, you can go either way. Um, apparently you did allocate some funds to eating out with people every week, but how did you yeah. manage your money um, with that new income, new lifestyle, new promotion? 
So um, yes, I got a promotion. I know you're probably going to ask me how much money I made. You don't have to answer that. And it's probably like 60, low 70s, something like that. Um, I don't remember. Ex no, it wouldn't have been low 70s. It's probably around 60. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I got an increase. Um, but it's not like I had lots of money. Yeah. But I did get like the Fox Theater series tickets and the Alliance Theater tickets and joined the Botanical Gardens and joined the Art Museum and, um, you know, sort of did got Braves tickets and, you know, did um, kind of those things. Now I didn't have orchestra seats and I didn't have, you know, seats behind the dugout. Um, but I, but I, I went and I did those kinds of things. And I, it was the first time I, um, I put a little more than the bottom of what you were required to put in for retirement. I didn't max on it or anything like that, but I did it like 1% or 2%, something, some little amount more than the bottom of what you were required. So I kind of had some idea that I was supposed to, like that would be a good thing to do. And I think I started to put, I don't know if it was exactly then, but I started to put aside a little bit of money, like in a money market account. And now that you, you have a little bit of extra money, did you call your dad and say, hey, dad, I'm, 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 I'm making it. You should be proud of me. But how do I handle this money? Did you bring in another financial advisor? Or did you have not, a friend not, that well with money? Not at that point. Not at that point. Okay. okay. No, um, I, I did not. I mean, I, I know in retrospect that would have been wise, but I did not do that at that point. I was still sort of like paying off student loans and mm. trying to just, you know, still paying for an apartment and, you know, no. What is your biggest advice to somebody who receives a promotion um, and, and, and what to do with their money, um, with that extra money that they're receiving? So, you know, I think a couple of things. One is, you know, decide what your values are, what you're going to do with that extra money. Mm -hmm. um, two, figure out how you're going to save some percentage of that extra money for whether that be for a rainy day or the roof that needs repair, or retirement, or the big trip you want to take, or whatever, like just starting to um, put some bigger percentage of that away than you were doing before. And, and, and certainly now that I do actively, I mean, I, I talked to my brother twice this morning about financial things. Um, so certainly, you know, I would have gotten uh, financial guidance earlier, more formal guidance earlier, for, without, without a doubt, because I didn't even think I had enough money to have guidance. And, and maybe all they would have said is instead of putting away 2%, do you think you could do 3%? Like, if you could get to 3%, then you get the match, like that gives you 6%, you know? And, and that's really only, you know, $27 a month. Do you think you could handle $27 a month? But I, I, don't, I don't think I could, I just didn't feel like I had enough money to do the basics. Makes sense. So what do you think is next for you? What, where do you see yourself probably in the next five years, 10 years? What are you doing? Are you gonna practice until you can't practice anymore? How do you see the next five years for yourself? So that's a great question because I just got one of those emails from Emory telling me, you have a big birthday coming up. It's time to sign up for Medicare. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I guess I would say a couple of things. Um, one is I just bought a, a wonderful house during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That house I mentioned before that was kind of mediocre at best, I lived in that house until I paid off the mortgage, mm -hmm. which was during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I made a choice to, to buy a very different kind of house, a, a beautiful, wonderful, lovely house. Um, and part of that choice was figuring out with my brother um, to live the way I want to live, pay that off, you know, in the time frame that, you know, an X time frame, you know, do I have to work longer? Mm -hmm. And if so, how much longer? And what does that look like? That was part of my decision making. Okay. Um, so I was very thoughtful, very thoughtful about that. Um, so um, my dad worked until he was 84. My mom would not want me to give her age, but I'll just say she's still working. Um, and um, so probably retirement fully isn't like in the cards very soon. I do think that there will come a time where I'll sort of cut back on a lot of the extra things I'm doing, um, but that's not right now. I have done the financial planning to kind of look at how much money do I wanna have um, to live at what level, when, when can I retire? What does my money look like? Um, and from a financial, from a purely financial perspective, um, I could retire in the next couple of years and pretty much be in good shape financially. Assume, assuming my brother has it figured out to if I live till 112. Um, yeah, I'm probably not living till 112, but we have it figured out in case I live till 112. And that's assuming I can kind of travel the way I want till like 93 or four or something. So it's pretty generously figured out, you know, and that's part of what we've sort of walked through. Also have it figured out as if I'm getting no money from external sources. Um, you know, some people are getting money from external sources and I might, but I have it figured out making decisions based on what I have now, not what I might have. Um, so from a purely financial perspective, I could retire in a couple of years, but I don't wanna do that. Um, on the other hand, I will probably sort of reduce some of the work responsibilities. And I was already starting to travel more before the pandemic hit, um, taking, sort of bigger, more grand trips, for example. Um, I've had to obviously cancel and reschedule those. Um, I have a bucket list and I um, really care about doing what I can. It's prioritized based on, we never know about our health and um, other, other things. But I certainly um, at some point along the way did get much more intentional about saving and about putting away for retirement while still being able to play. I, I make a lot more money than that 36 or $38,000 that I started making. And um, you'll appreciate that, but this, but um, right before my dad died, the last kind of real conversation we had, my mom walked out of the room and my dad said, honey, you know, how, how much do you have saved? Mm -hmm. and, and I told him and he smiled and he said, I, I'm proud of you. You're going to be in good shape, really good shape. And, and I have really taken that to heart and been, um, been very intentional about, about those decisions. Um, and so I, I feel like even if the market were to crash, I could kind of manage through things and be okay. And um, um, my brothers helped me figure out how much risk I want to take and how conservative I want to be and what percentage of risk maybe I should take given who I am and what percent, you know, and just really, and, and there's no right or wrong about that. It's about fitting with, with who we are. And I think having a financial advisor that helps you figure out what's consistent with your realities and your values is what is what's really important. Really good. 
It's real good. Um, two more questions and I'll let you go. I appreciate you being so patient. The first question is, what keeps your drive to be motivated to work? In my field, I see some, it's like a, all of a sudden some switches and somebody says, I don't want to work anymore. And it's usually because they haven't nurtured their career in a way that keeps them motivated and looking for that next thing. In our world, in your world, you have to read a lot, you have to write a lot, you have to communicate with folks, you have to mentor, manage. It, it's a lot. So what keeps you going and saying, no, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore, especially because, you know, you could walk away, you may not live the life you want to, but you could walk away at any time. So I think that I've been somebody who I haven't just had one career trajectory. Mm. I've done a lot of different things. And I think that keeps me engaged. And so, for example, when the pandemic first hit, and when I mean that, I mean like the first week, um, I pivoted and started providing support to frontline healthcare workers. And within a couple of weeks, I had formed a program called Caring Communities, which is a program for, for frontline healthcare workers. And it, it started at Grady and it expanded at Emory Healthcare and then it expanded to CHOA. And now it's become a, not only a national model, but a global model. And um, I received a grant to bring the program to um, Wuhan and Beijing. And I've done a tremendous amount of co consulting in African nations um, during this pandemic. And um, I had wanted to switch my career to be doing more global work and I hadn't been able to figure out how to do it. The pandemic hit, I wasn't even thinking about global work. I was just trying to figure out how to take care of nurses and docs and respiratory therapists in the ICUs with COVID patients. And I just started to do, to take care of people and um, be there for them every day in every way. And word got out and um, the United States, um, US Department of State hired me to consult to embassies in the Middle East and Africa and around the world, um, WHO, Africa hired me um, and, and I was able to take kind of what we were in the middle of and say, what, what uniquely can I bring to this table to help? And um, I, I knew I didn't have the skills to save people's lives, but I realized that I had some skills to help save the emotional well-being of the people we needed on the front lines to save people's lives. And if I could contribute in that way, then I was, then I was prepared to walk into the COVID ICUs every week, sometimes every day since the pandemic started. And I've been somebody who, you know, if you had told me a month before that, that's what I was going to be doing with my life for a year and a half, I would have said, no, I'm not in that phase of my life. But that's as long as I still have that kind of passion that I can use my experience, my leadership training, my leadership wisdom, my leadership experience to, to help others like that. And that that's what I'm pulled to do when I'm needed, then I'm going to do it. And, and the day I quit feeling like doing that, the day I quit caring when, when people are hurting or when people are dying, that's when I need to walk out and gracefully retire. Mm. Um, or obviously if I get sick. Um, so I think it's paying attention inside and, you know, does this still speak to me? Is this still meaningful for me? And, and right now it still is for me. I love it. And for our last question, what would be your number one by somebody who just finished their postdoc program. They're excited. They're going to practice in the area that they've studied years for. What is that one key nugget you want to pass on to them and say, look out for this, take care of this, worry about this. What is that one thing you would like to share for them? The one thing I wish I had been told is you have to do what you're passionate about, not what your parents think, not what your advisor thinks, not what your boss thinks. You've got to figure out what 
what makes you tick, what you're passionate about. And you have to figure out how to pursue that, how to make that work and go, go for it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, everybody, this is Randall Avery. This is Building Wealth with Mental Health. My guest today was Dr. Nadine Caslow. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so very much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. This is a production of RSA Diesel Advisors, a wealth management firm servicing the community of licensed professional counselors, psychologists, and psychiatrists. If you are in need of financial guidance, we would be happy to serve you.